I think what I've realized is it's easy to be creative, but hard to be business minded. Mm -hmm. So everything that I do on the coaching front has literally been fueled by me wanting to show other freelancers, you can make a living doing what you love, uh, regardless of what anyone else is gonna say. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the 505 Podcast. Today, we welcome two very special guests. These two are hosts of the Mid Convo Podcast. They are photographers, filmmakers, and business owners. Everyone, please give a warm welcome to Ed Lee and Paul Weaver. Air horns. Air horns. Welcome, boys. Welcome. Okay, so I told you guys I briefed you in the beginning. We got the one-handed crack challenge to start us off. So please don't mess this up. I have high hopes in both of you. One hand off the table. Let's see it. Paul, you can go first. I can pick it up. Oh, you can pick it up. Yeah, you gotta right. pick it up. Okay. Boom. Ooh. Oh, okay. Splash effect. Give Ooh. me a spin on the table. Now you're good. You can give me a spin. Big dent there on the, on wow. the side. Dang oh, it. That might wow. be a, it's a really big dent. Sheesh. I'm right. nervous. Paul's I'm like getting actually, a, Paul's I'm getting a 5-1 to start us off. So Ed, <laughs> Ed get it going. Bro, I'm actually nervous right now. I'm not even gonna lie. You pick okay, it up. Ed, you got it. Oh, oh Ed. that was clean. Ed, that was clean. Spin us for us. Oh, Ed, there's, no, there's a dent though. I think that was there before. <laughs> <laughs> Ed, Ed's getting a seven eight to start let's us go, off. Let's, let's go, go, Ed. Go. Welcome, boys. So you guys kind of this is very last minute. Super spontaneous. Explain to me why you guys are in LA. Yeah. So we run a podcast called The Mid Convo, and we're doing these quarterly trips to see, get was, guests was, on the that pod. Was a nine, that six, was good. Yeah. But no, we thought it'd be cool to come out to LA to get guests on the podcast, mm. and then also Ed's in Seattle. I'm in Miami. It's like a pretty far distance or like yeah. literally, so whenever, quite literally on opposite points of the country. So whenever yeah. we can come together in person and record just makes a big difference. What made you kind of start this pod on opposite ends of the country? When did that come about? It's a good, interesting story. Yeah. So I actually started mid combo as a podcast by myself, um, right around the time I quit my job back in 2018. Mm. And it was just a passion project at the time. It, honestly, podcast podcasting wasn't that big. It was just something that I felt passionate about. Just have conversations. We were saying that yeah. earlier. I was like, brain was like, dude, it's really hard to get a podcast off the ground. It is. And now it's a little bit more, uh, it's just like more common for po people to even listen to podcasts. Like I wasn't even listening to podcasts sure, in 2018, yeah. mm -hmm. let alone had the idea to start one. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, likewise. I think short form content definitely sped up the process a little bit on that and the video aspect. But uh, basically me and Paul, when we connected, there was a trip we went on um, when we finally got to like do a couple projects together. He invited me and my wife, Christine, to go on a trip uh, with some friends he has in San Miguel, Mexico. And so that was a really cool experience. And then me and Paul, we've always just talked business, chop it up. We just love talking about creative stuff. And I was telling him about the podcast and I said, dude, it's like so hard to stay consistent with it. Also, I'm just talking to myself all the time. So I wish I had someone to banter things off of. And it was a very like last minute spontaneous thing where I was like, Paul, you should be my co-host. Yeah, that was dope. Yeah. And then we I had all my podcast stuff because I wanted to initially have him on as like a guest because I was running podcasts mm -hmm. at the time. And then we just hopped on the mic and it just felt so natural. And I feel like our conversation flow was good. So I was like, dude, you want to join mid-combo? Yeah. And now we, I went through a whole rebranding phase. I hit up my designer who made my cover <laughs> art. And I was like, yo, I have a co-host now. Can you just like redo this exact cover art, but add another head? Nice. <laughs> That's what we did. That's dope. And had you had the idea to podcast at all before? Or was this? I actually had, um, but I kind of ran into the same thing as Ed was facing, where it's like speaking to yourself on a podcast mm. is challenging. And uh, I wanted to make it be something that I could do with someone else. So I actually had been kind of planning on my mood board, if you will, to eventually do my own. So when Ed asked me, I was like, bro, I haven't even heard of the mid combo, but it sounds dope. <laughs> and uh, I remember that in Mexico, I remember like going back to my room because we kind of were at this villa and I was like listening to all the episodes you had done. And I'm like, I told my wife, I'm like, I think I'm going to hop on as a co-host. This sounds awesome. So I think we've done about 20 episodes together now. Yeah. And I think... It, we make it really spontaneous and it was a spontaneous thing. But to be honest, I don't know if I ever told you this, but things like podcast co-hosts, I'm really calculated about that kind of stuff because I've done businesses with other people. And I personally sometimes are scared to mix more business commitment mm -hmm. things with close friends. Because I'm like, if it doesn't go well, you could lose a friend and you lose the business. So mm -hmm. I was a little bit, a little nervous because I was like, this we're kind of taking not 
not that many people were dating or anything, but it was kind of taking <laughs> kind to the of. next level as totally. far as becoming a podcast co-host. Mm-hmm. And you guys know, like with co-hosts, you have to flow. And if it's just awkward, let's say just you say yes, you bring co-host on, it doesn't flow. Mm-hmm. You're kind of like, all right, well, you're still my good buddy, but yeah. we suck on the mic. So, you know, what's up? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's just, it was interesting, but I'm, I'm thankful that in the long run, it really worked out. And I'm super excited for all that mid-combo. Has and to it's, come. it's funny you bring up like, not that it's like dating but like taking the next step and like being cautious of ruining mm-hmm. a friendship like for sure if you're good friends you're like oh nothing's gonna happen mm-hmm. like of course it's all gonna be like all good mm-hmm. and then you never know like yeah the little uh, something small can set you know a, a weird thing i don't know like it's, it's tough mixing like friendship and business i think um i'm glad that me and brayden and chase have been i mean chase not here but i'm just glad that we've been able to do it and like it is really nice having like two other co-hosts to bounce ideas off of each other. Like if you're interviewing someone or even just having a conversation, it can be like, there's times where I'm like, I don't know what the fuck to say. And then like Graydon and Chase pick it up and I'm like, oh, this is great. Yeah, you get the homies to pick up the slides. Yeah, exactly. and it's like, all right, yeah, reel it back, reel it back. Reel you start back. looking at them in the eyes like, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's so good. Wait, so when, when did you both get into the creative space? Is this like a high school thing? Did you guys both go to college? Was there no college? What did it kind of look like? I want to throw it to you, Ed. I want to hear this. You want me to go first? Yeah. A young uh, Edward Lee. So, yeah, I guess this could either be like, a 30 minute thing or it could be like a five second answer but we'll try to make it somewhat concise i went to school for digital marketing and entrepreneurship like college got mm-hmm. my bachelor's in that but throughout high school i've always just loved photography like i've always loved ph- photography i remember back in the day people who remember like the samsung galaxy line when the first hey. when they first came out they had it w- it was basically their version of like portrait mode at the time where they blurred the background and i was so fascinated by that then I got my first like Canon Rebel camera from Costco that my parents got me. And I had when I got my first Nifty 50 Prime lens and I took like a photo of like this can or something on a table. I was mind blown. I was like, yo, this is this is crazy. It's all blurred. It's all background. I went through my whole shooting only flowers phase where I'm just like shooting trees and random stuff. Hands. Hand, yeah, hands out. Yeah, I've been through all that. And I think just being in the Pacific Northwest at the time, there was a lot of landscape photographers coming on the scene. Like early IG days, everyone was posting like landscape photos and Everyone's trying to go on that PNW vibe. So I've always had an interest in photography. And then after I graduated um, uh, college and working a bunch of odd jobs, I wanted to immerse myself a little bit more into the video, photo, the whole space. Got a job at a place called Rhino Camera Gear. So they make like sliders Mm -hmm. for people who aren't, you know, they make motorized sliders. And I was there for two years. It was like a blur. Those two years went by so fast, but I learned a ton as a creative, just being on a team environment. I was young, so I also learned just more professionalism, being in meetings with other people who are older than me, all those types of deals. Then I quit in 2018 to do my own thing. And then that's kind of where the freelance side was born, my whole um, desire to help creatives and get involved more in that, the podcast, all those things kind of sprouted from making that jump and doing my own thing. Were you doing freelance stuff on top of your full-time job and then the freelance was kind of like, okay, I could turn this into a full-time thing or like how, where were you career-wise? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for me, it was a little bit on the side, but it was not something I was trying to do full-time. I always was scared to do the make the whole jump, but it was calculated. Like before I quit my job, there's a few retainers that I had ready to go before I quit my job because I can forecast my uh, income. But there was a period where I was looking at, I mean, I love my job at Rhino. I love the people I work with, but there was a point in time where I met a lot of people through that job, uh, like influencers. Um, this is like a story for another day, but like Peter McKinnon was like mm-hmm. a really big, as I'm sure a lot of people are in like the creative space, mm-hmm. was a big inspiration for me when I was first trying to get into the scene. And Rhino sponsored a trip for Peter and Maddie to go to Iceland. And so like I was responsible for shooting video. So I've been like the bunking beds with oh, Peter wow. and Maddie, like in a small area. Yeah, you guys brushing teeth together. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of Iceland. No, literally. Yeah. And I don't talk about that story much like on just my own stuff but i learned so much in that process and being around because i handled in influencers ambassadors mm-hmm. for rhino like i would be representing the brand trying to get other creators to work with me mm-hmm. so i was exposed to a lot of that environment and i just thought to myself like dang i remember being in ireland one time and there was a creator event where everyone was like hanging out all the creators all the youtubers they're like kicking it it's like super clicky and i'm like one of the brands that are just kind of there as like the videographer for the brand mm-hmm. and i was just thinking to myself like dang like i'm trying to I'm trying to be like one of the creators. Like I want to go out there and like do my own thing. And I loved my job, but I said, maybe this is the time I start thinking about pivoting. 
And so, yeah, I started to think more on like income, get really calculated with it. But I was taking on gigs on the side so that when I jumped, it wasn't just like with no income. Yeah, we talk about that, too. I think it's so important. I mean, like you can just blindly hop into it. Like mm-hmm. people have done it, but mm-hmm. I think it's so much a lesser of a of a risk to yeah. have to have that income. Know that you have a few retainers locked in, know that you have a little bit of money saved in case your retainers fly away. And then you're like, OK, I just moved out to L.A. and now I don't have any money coming in. How did you kind of get into That's it, good. Paul? Yeah, I feel like similar situation. I went to college for economics and business marketing at the University of Minnesota. And then growing up in Minnesota, there was such a huge music influence on the city. Mm -hmm. So I fell in love with going to all the concerts on the weekends. And I would bring my dad's uh, Canon Rebel T2i and just absolutely crush the ISO. (laughs) (laughs) And I would use this stock lens and he'd be like, you better come home with this thing as as nice as it it was. So I um, grew up just shooting a lot of concerts for free shooting from the crowd. And then I was drawn to the behind the scenes. So my start was in the music industry. Mm. Um, Ended up sneaking backstage. A lot of these big music venues in Minneapolis would capture the behind the scenes content for artists to use on their MySpace and like Facebook pages. Dang, MySpace. Yeah, you're really dating yourself there. (laughs) I had to. (laughs) But this was 10 years ago. Yeah, seriously. Uh, And I had a portfolio. And when I went off to college, I sent it off to all these independent music artists. And then I got a few emails back. And that next summer I was on a US tour. So like that was the moment where I'm like, wait, I can get paid to do this. And that was doing photo. And then fun story, one of the first stops on that tour, it was for this R&B singer named Somo. He's with Republic Records Mm now. I was in Iowa and I remember I was friends with Ben um, Haggerty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Ben. And (laughs) Black with no cream. Bro, he was a musician at that time. And I texted him, yeah. Oh, wow. And uh, it was called Schooled Life. And I texted him like, bro, I'll get you on the guest list. Can you teach me how to shoot video backstage? <laughs> Bro, he showed up. I handed him my Canon, my Canon Rebel T2i, figured out the settings for me. That, from that point on, I was shooting video on that tour, shooting like <laughs> Somo Sundays, which were like his versions of like cover videos on tour. Um, but at that moment, I remember getting off that tour. It was about 15 stops one summer. And my parents were like, all right, you got to get a real job. <laughs> and graduated from college got a job at an agency, built that cushion that I feel like I've heard a lot in the freelance Mm -hmm. world, like build that cushion at a job and then you can take the leap. While I was at that agency, I was learning so much shooting for some pretty big fashion brands that on the weekends and on like the evenings, I was burning that midnight oil, building my retainer list for Mm -hmm. my clients. So then I could take that leap and do full time. So I'd say like, I've been doing it full time for about six years now. And um, it's been awesome. That's awesome. Fun fact, I took your workshop oh cool uh the like what was it the you did it online recently. webinar the online yeah the webinar. online webinar yep. like the hundred thousand dollars of creative oh you yeah talk about retainer clients the six fig uh, yes. business mm-hmm. framework i've taken that too yeah yeah before that's awesome. i met paul it's phenomenal Dude, thank you and um one of the big things you talk about that like really resonated with me is like i knew it but sometimes you know something and then you hear somebody else say it in maybe a different way and it, mm-hmm. and it resonates yeah. with you but just like the importance of having those retainer clients to like one, give you the freedom to maybe pass up on certain um, certain opportunities that come your way that like wow. you don't want to do. Mm. Um, but then also like that's the way to build a six figure business as a yeah, creative. Yeah, totally. Bro, that's so funny. Yeah. <laughs> Backstory on that. During the pandemic, someone told me, hey, you should launch an online course. I'm like, yo, I hate education. Because <laughs> I've been getting hit by all these get rich quick ads. All the ads, yeah. yeah. And um, Some Ty Lopez. that's kind of how, <laughs> seriously, I... Uh, First course was how to land brands without leaving your house, mm. pandemic course. Great. Perfect. And then Great the Six Fig Photo Biz Framework was probably like my favorite webinar that I've done because honestly, it was just me sharing how I built my business and sharing things. It was like four hours long, I remember. And I'm like, no one's going to listen to this thing. And uh, it's cool to hear that you were part of it yeah. because I never get to hear feedback for the most part on that one. Um, that's yeah, cool. That's cool. That's really cool. Did I just you- thought it was great how much like, how much value you provided in that in that three hour workshop i remember being like man i I do kind of want to hire you as like a coach but like i'm not i'm not at that point because i was like i'm just doing like the music stuff right now Mm -hmm. but i feel like i took away so much from that workshop that's awesome like 
I just wanted to give you that like feedback of Thank like, you. this is great. Like, That's awesome. and I know Brayden and I talk about how he has an online course and how it can kind yeah. of feel. Of course, bros. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. It can, it like, there's a stigma around it yeah. of it being like yeah. scammy or whatever. Mm-hmm. But if you go about it, I think the right way, it's not scamming. You're yeah. like, oh, I'm actually providing value. Mm-hmm. And you'll see the lives but, change, dude. You know, like you'll see them, you'll yeah. get the real world feedback of, oh, I got a job doing this or I made 10K this month. And you're like, Okay, I'm actually physically changing awesome. people's mm-hmm. lives, you know, mm-hmm. and it's not just like the Ty Lopez guy where it's like, yeah, buy yeah, this yeah. course and you'll make a million dollars next week. <laughs> yeah. you, you know, the Lamborghini. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the books, all the books, the, books, the million the books, books on the fucking wall. Books uh, on the wall. So I want to talk to you a little bit about you know diversifying as mm. creatives because I I personally love business. It's like my favorite thing of the creative space yeah. is the business side mm-hmm. of it. So why did you guys you know i i i've i've creeped down on both of your pages in the hour and a half that i had to prepare for this podcast. <laughs> we so, appreciate the honesty awesome. yeah, so i um uh, i saw that you know you have an online webinar you also have a coaching program i saw that you have a studio space right mm. you have all these different things that you guys are both doing so mm-hmm. why did you get into that why did you kind of say okay I can make stuff, right? We all make stuff. We mm-hmm. can make money making stuff, but why hop into this other lane? I want to hear it from both of you. Well, the studio space, not that you mention it, it's interesting because I actually got rid of the studio space mm. like a couple months back mm. and 2022 was like a huge learning experience for me. Mm. Um, I think over the years I've tried to see, I think as a creative, I'm always trying to see what works. Mm. I also, similar to yourself, like just love business and me and Paul are just constantly, I mean, we are creatives what we do for work mm. but i think truly where our passion lies is just business mm. and talking about how we can turn ideas into profits mm. or how we can <laughs> connect with more people through business like that kind of stuff gets me fired up mm. and i think for me just diversifying where i'm always trying to look for ways i can allocate more of my creativity um i that's think i think that's why i didn't really last in the wedding industry just for me personally like it was too rigid like you're creative like for the first year and then after that it becomes a system Mm -hmm. and i think for me as creatives like we're always trying to figure out ways to like find new systems find new ways find new paths and so the studio was one i really love coaching and i wanted to get back into coaching but this year i realized i was doing too much and so i've really dialed it back Mm -hmm. and there's this, uh, I forgot where, so Cal Newport, um, he's an author of a book called Deep Work. Mm. He was on a podcast recently and he said something that was, uh, kind of was an epiphany for me. He was saying, trying to do too much is like trying to go outside and catch rain. Like, <laughs> it's like you're running around trying to catch, like if you're just, mm. if you just stay in one spot, mm. you're going to catch the most rain. Mm-hmm. But if you're constantly running around, it's going to be hard to catch anything. At the end of the day, you're not going to have any like water in your bucket. Mm-hmm. And I thought about that with my business. I was thinking, dang, I'm just trying to do way too much right now. I just got like stick in one spot, like double down and then lift up my head in like five years and see where I'm at. Mm. So that's kind of where I'm at as far as diversifying. I love that part, but then I also want to hone in on what I'm good at and then just stick to it. I love that. What percentage of your like business, I guess, is working with clients versus like workshops and and all that Mm. other stuff you're doing? I would say right now, client work is still a big part of what I do as far as income like split. I would say during the pandemic, the, you know, I know it's, I hate the word, but just like the influencer side of things, like Mm. brand integrations, I guess, sponsorships, brand Mm. integrations kind of took more of a role because during the pandemic, I was doing more YouTube and just like being around home more, like trying to build home office, Mm. like kind of rode that niche for a little bit. But definitely I'm at a point where I would say it's maybe like 50, 50 now where 50% of my income comes from client work. And then another 50% of my income comes from affiliates, brand integrations, sponsorships Mm. and whatnot but I don't ever want to be only on one side for that Mm -hmm. because I feel like when you're too only on the brand sponsorship side, you just become like a walking ad. Yeah, Mm -hmm. definitely. You're just always doing ad reads. You're always (laughs) doing sponsorships. It's just like creatively like they feel that i think the people feel that too they're like okay paul every single video or photo (laughs) on paul's grid is a fucking ad like uh paul show us the cool stuff that you're doing again exactly so tell us a little bit about what it is that you're doing from your business side yeah i think it's all been birthed out of the feeling when i first started when people told me photography was more of a hobby i'm like the frick Mm -hmm. and uh i soon realized you can make money from it and the more researched i did there was public information on like LinkedIn and like Glassdoor and Indeed where it said what the average that a photographer made in the US was, it's like 60,000. And to be honest, my goal when I got into it and I started realizing, wow, it really does matter when you focus on the business side, not just the creative, Mm -hmm. that I was fueled to share with others how you're able to crush that industry standard. 
Um, so I feel like my business for the most part, I got to a point where I'm like, all right, I'm going to niche down to health, wellness, and fitness. I'm going to work with, those are going to be the type of like brands that I focus on. And through that, I've had people reach out to me and be like, Paul, you're really good at like the coaching side of things and like the business side. And I think that's just kind of who I am. I've always been obsessed with like numbers and pricing and negotiation and like the admin stuff that most people don't like. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think what I've realized is it's easy to be creative, but hard to be business minded. Mm -hmm. So everything that I do on the coaching front has literally been fueled by me wanting to show other freelancers, you can make a living doing what you love, uh, regardless of what anyone else is gonna say. Um, so for me, it's just been kind of this like new thing, becoming a coach within the last three years during the pandemic. When I launched my course actually for the first time, <laughs> it's like 30 people signed up for my course. Mm. And I was like, cool, I broke even, whatever. And then when the pandemic hit, a uh, thousand people were in the course. Wow. So 30 to a thousand, my team grew by five. So all of a sudden I'm like, wait, am I a coach? Am I a photographer? Am I a videographer? How do I brand myself? So that's when the freelance photographer was born, which is my coaching program. I really like what you said about how you didn't want to be seen as like this. You're just a coach. You still make really great stuff. Yeah. You know? And I, that's, I feel like what I was struggling with is I'm like, I don't want every single vid on my grid to be, hey, buy my course. It's dropping now. Like, I just don't want to be that person, you know, and I yeah. still want to provide value because I love making things. So it's like mm -hmm. still trying to find this balance of, you know, what it is that I want to do and you know, still helping people. Mm -hmm. So now for for both of you, I think this is really interesting because we're at a time where online coaching is growing like crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a huge boom. You said you went from 30 to a thousand do you think in the next year, two years, are you going to double down on the online coaching or are you going to, you know, how do you kind of pick this path that you're kind of building? You guys are both doing great things in each of your different spaces. That's a great question. I think it hit me recently. I'm in Miami now. Mm -hmm. I'm from Minneapolis. I don't want to be shooting fitness content on the beach when I'm 50. Don't want to do that. <laughs> like, I love the idea. <laughs> I love like the idea about like coaching, mm -hmm. um, consultant mm -hmm. and I think it comes natural for me to just share with others like topics that most people aren't willing to talk about. Mm. So I see myself doubling down on like the mid combo because mm. um, I think podcasting is a great way to like reach people. But I do see coaching taking over my business entirely, um, probably within the next five to 10 years. Mm. The reason why I'm still shooting is because I'm extremely passionate about it. And also, um, I don't know, I feel like in order to coach on it, I got to be in it. So everything that I coach on, I typically am like, doing with my own clients, testing, like even iPhone videos are now a thing that you can add on to packages. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a thing years ago. Yeah. How about you? In terms of coaching? Yeah. Or, or just, just kind of what you see your business mm -hmm. from, you know, you said you tried the studio that you didn't love that or what? Yeah. You know? Yeah. It was just like not enough profit for me mm -hmm. to make it worth like the energy that I was spending on it. But I think for me right now, more general as like the market of creator market, mm. I think we're going through like a crazy time right now as a creative like there's it's like the golden era to be a creator right now because anybody and their mom is like trying to get on social in some sort of fashion whether that's like tiktok twitter youtube i still think youtube interestingly enough is kind of like the foundational platform for every like everyone that wants to low-key build an audience on youtube or transition their audience in some fashion to youtube but i think right now my goal is to honestly just be adaptive to anything that's changing i think early on when there was like more set in stone like algorithm tricks and whatnot with especially with instagram or tiktok you could really have a style hone in on the style and literally just milk that bread and butter which is fine you could still do that but i think right now with how many changes are going through on these platforms like youtube is doing shorts like mm -hmm. instagram is going through like we're going to prioritize photo no we're actually doing video mm -hmm. no let's change the button of this layout like so i think with all that as a creative you need to be ready to adapt and if you're not ready to adapt, you're kind of going to get left behind mm -hmm. in a couple of years. So right now for me, I'm just kind of focusing on uh, YouTube, focusing on the podcast mid combo and then client work because I, I just love I geek out about camera stuff. You can talk camera stuff. Oh, all yeah. Day, so. <laughs> yeah. I'm a gearhead. Yeah, but we'll, we'll literally save that for another time. <laughs> yeah. Paul's Paul and I talk about gear sometimes, but he's kind of opposite than me. That's where mm -hmm. I can't relate. Yeah. Guys, like I've been running with the same camera setup yeah. six, seven years now. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. Ed, yeah, com yeah. Ed comes over and I'm like, bro. How do I like rig this thing up? <laughs> I'm constantly selling them, but we had a Komodo like a few months ago. We yeah, yeah. sold it. Now we have two C70s. It's just, it's Man. wild. I, I can totally agree to what you're saying about, I don't want to be 50 on the beach shooting fitness content, 
for me right now i'm doing music stuff and i'm on tour damn near every weekend and i'm like mm. this is great now because i'm in my mid-20s and i have like energy and i can that. do it mm. but i don't want to be doing this forever it's not a sustainable lifestyle mm. and also the fact that you brought up in the next like five to ten years you see yourself going 100 percent to coaching but right now you like still want to be in it are you familiar with Chris Doe? Oh, I love Chris Doe. Okay, we, love, we Chris. love his stuff. I met him in Santa Monica like a few months ago. He's walking down the street. Oh, Chris! <laughs> like, he's, he's like, like who is he's this? Like, what the he's a good dude. Yeah, That's he's awesome. Like, I love Chris. That kind of reminds you. me of that because he put in his 10,000 hours, his 20 plus years yeah. as being an incredible like designer. Mm -hmm. And now he's turned his business into this full time, like seven figure coaching business. Mm -hmm. And that kind of reminds me of what I see you doing, I mm. guess. Can you talk about the importance though of like putting in your time, learning your craft to then get to the point of being able to coach on it? Because I mm. feel like, that's good. you know, it's great to have, you know, a, a digital product where you're teaching and getting into the coaching side of things. But I feel like you don't want to get into it prematurely because you want to build that trust mm. and you want to have people know that like you do know what you're talking about mm -hmm. i feel like you don't want to get into it like yeah. prematurely and your name's mm -hmm. everything yeah. you know yeah not something that like i feel like you see a lot of the a lot of coaches there's this the big one right now i feel like is like make 150k as an agency owner like next week and yeah. it's like well if you've never shot a fucking video or a photo <laughs> or like maybe 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 you go make the videos and photos first and then you get into this you know yeah. what i mean what are your kind of your thoughts on that that's uh, good it's tough that is a tough one because i do think there are a lot of people who have a lot of valuable knowledge to share, but are held back because of like imposter syndrome where they mm -hmm. feel like they're not qualified to teach. I know some of the most talented people that could be hosting fire workshops, but they don't because they're like, maybe I'm maybe I'm not cut out. Mm -hmm. Like I'm worried that there's way people way better than me. But there's something that I feel like we've all have learned is that no matter what level you're at, creatively speaking, yeah, you might get some people who are always going to throw shade like, okay, I know more than this guy. Mm -hmm. that, that's like, there's always going to be people yeah. like that online. Mm -hmm. But there's always going to be people under you that can learn from you. And this is like true at any level, mm -hmm. at any number of followers, at any level in your career. Like there's always going to be people asking you for tips mm. and things that you can like teach on. So I think it really, you have to more so self-reflect on whether or not you're willing to like grow and ride it out as, as like a coach as like do you enjoy that mm. or you're just doing it to because you feel like you should be doing it or do you actually love helping people and just don't like stop there as you grow bring these people up with you mm. and teach them as you learn it's kind of sharing that journey you Definitely. know yeah. that's good what about you paul i think first thing that comes to mind is um you got to get your reps in mm -hmm. i'm careful saying that sometimes because there's actually people in my coaching program way older than me and like way better than me at like creating content and like filmmaking i'm not even a filmmaker but i shoot video but um, I think that's a big part of it. I also think um, one thing that I've been really intentional about is saying yes to things where I know I'm gonna be able to try something on that I haven't before mm -hmm. or an experience. I've shot music, I've shot fashion, I've shot beauty, I've shot literally almost every single category. Um, and there was there were seasons when I look back at it where I'm like, dang, I hate that I'm shooting fashion. But looking back at it, I'm glad I did try that on because now I'm actually able to speak into it when I come like along someone who's like a full-time fashion photographer, maybe in LA trying to grow their business. I'm like, Hey, let me share what worked for me or like what I learned. So I don't know. I think coaching can seem sexy. Um, and it's definitely not for everybody. When I first started, I started with very, very small beginner photography workshops in Minneapolis, teaching people how to turn their camera on. <laughs> I hated it <laughs> teaching like a lady that was 60 how to turn on her shutter because she found the workshop through Eventbrite. I'm like, she's not even on my Instagram. She found it through Eventbrite. Uh -huh. But um, awesome. I'm thankful for that because that focus group, I feel like helped me get to a point where now I'm able to build it online and make it so, I don't know, it's pretty streamlined at this point. I think like one thing I'd love to add to that is in the coaching side, a lot of people, maybe you can also, I would love to hear your experience on this too, but you get really up in your own head once you are starting to put together like modules or courses mm -hmm. and you start to second guess. And it's a long process. Like you put together a product, it can be really overwhelming and you start to real think, is this going to be good enough? And then you maybe pull out. I can guarantee you there's so many modules and courses that have been shot from creators that just never made it to the public. Yeah, yeah. Like I actually have a full like half module, like I've shot like five modules of like a seven module course that I wanted to launch back in like 2020. 
but I just buried it. It's like living in a hard drive right now. And it's because I took so long to bring it to market that by the time I was kind of ready, I've learned so much already. My thoughts have changed on like the mo first module that I mm, shot. Wow. So I think in that, in that light, I, that's why I appreciate about Paul is like, he's really good at just choosing something, taking action and then bringing it to market. Mm -hmm. You don't dwell too much in like, are people going to like mm -hmm. this? Is this good? Is this lighting good? Like done is better than perfect. Learn from it move on to the next course. Like kind of get into that mindset because if you try to think too long on what yeah. your coaching path will look like, you may just like never start. Yeah. It took me a year and like 10 or a year and two months to do my first one. It yeah. took me like five months to do the second one. Cause once wow. I, once I figured it out, I was like, okay, this is, this is how you build the website. This is the most important thing in this process and get it I, out. Yeah, yeah. And I think what's cool is you can pre-sell the damn thing before you make it. Yeah. So you mm. can, you can be contacting people that are maybe interested in it, you know, f posting stories and say, Hey, is this something That's that sweet. this is something you would be interested in? Like, tell me what your problems are right now. And you can, gather information and learn about what your audience is struggling with before mm -hmm. you even put said mm -hmm, thing out. Mm -hmm. So you guys both make amazing content. I was joking with Costas. Did you guys go to like fucking IG grid school? Because <laughs> your, grid, your, 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 your grids are very on point. I'm jealous. Bro, tell me why that's all. Actually, Ed, I'm, actually, I'm just yes. inspired no. by Ed. <laughs> Bro, you are Mr. S. No, yeah, 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 yeah. Ed, Ed wrote the book on it, but IG grid school. Seriously. Funny. Did you, um, when a client does come to both of you, right? Yeah. What is that pre-production process? process look like once I come and I say Paul this is the brief I want to do this with my brand what comes next for both of you guys after mm. that process yeah, we kind of want to get into the nitty-gritty of like process, Creative process. Mm -hmm. and yeah and the yeah. business side of shit first thing I do is I'll check first of all read the email and do as much research as I can mm. while also messaging them within 24 hours to get on a discovery call you gotta hop on a call I literally will never give pricing I'll never res like respond in detail until we get on a call so typically over Zoom so we can do face to face. Mm. And then from that point on, I'm just talking about scope, deliverables. Um, I love asking what's your budget and trying to win that dance. Mm -hmm. And then we hop into the project and I'm kind of the one, depending on the scope of the project, doing all the producer roles too. Mm -hmm. I might bring on a team um, and then we have kind of a timeline and contract in place. Nice. Are a lot of the brands that you both are working with, because you're in Miami, you're in Seattle, are they hitting you up and saying, hey, you source the models, this is the product, go do it? Or as the brands usually located in Seattle, Miami, are you flying to them? What does it kind of look like for both of you right now? Yeah, I would say a lot of my clients are actually not based in Seattle. Mm -hmm. They're kind of all around. But typically the type of clients that I work with is, yeah, they send me the product. They're like, we love your work. You handle it. Like find the talent, find the location. We trust your vision. And then I pretty much just pitched them my idea with the product they have in place. And then we talked the budget and then we just kind of get going on it. I have also on the flip side of that, though, done projects where they kind of have everything ready. Like they're like, we have the models, mm -hmm. we have the location. Here's our product. We just need like a DP or something. Yeah, right. That's, so beautiful that's more. That yeah. I mean, that's more like if you're to work for an agency or production house, like you have one role, you fulfill that role like really well and you get paid. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I think when we're talking about more of the freelance creative where they get a budget and they kind of handle A through mm -hmm. Z. Yeah, that's that's pretty much still where I'm at. Mm. And yeah. Is there anything about the process that has changed now that you've you've been doing it? You said for a, a minute, you've been doing it for a minute. We all are full time, right? Like, is there anything in this process you're like, I didn't used to do this and this has severely saved me a bunch of headaches with them because I'm sure we've all dealt with a client that could be annoying or mm -hmm. excess revisions, like the whole nine yards. Is there anything in that process you're like, this was really helpful for me? I think the most crucial thing is that discovery call. Yeah. Asking the right questions on the call versus bringing it to email and sending them a freaking bullet list or yeah. questionnaire. I, I love when I'm able to crush a discovery call and it's like 15 minutes and we walk away knowing the scope and the budget and we're both on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, if they're not willing to give me the budget, I'll kind of share with them where I think the budget should be based on the scope. But that is crucial. I think a lot of freelancers drop the ball by trying to do it over email. And then I think they also dropped the ball by not asking the hard questions yeah. on that phone call. They don't like to talk about money. Creatives are get nervous yeah. when they start yeah. talking Can about Can you give money. us some of your favorite questions to ask oh, on a totally. discovery Bro, call? we have a podcast episode on this. Hey, yeah, that was good. <laughs> Go check yeah. it out. I'll, I'll name, I'll call it three. Yeah. Uh, first one is, um, can you share some examples of what you're looking to achieve? Because hmm. 
Ed, I love how Ed Zone actually told me that one when we first met. Mm-hmm. He's like, if they send you a freaking Super Bowl commercial, yeah, exactly. and their budget is like, what's going to get them maybe a social reel? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 500 bucks. You got to call it out. <laughs> can you do for me? Yeah. Um, so that's the first one. Second one is I'll be like, um, you know, have you worked with any content creators in the past? And what did you like and what you dislike? Mm. Just making sure that, again, it's like speed dating. Yeah. I tell people it's strategic speed dating. Third one is just what's your budget? I love that. If they fill out the contact form on my website and it's they just like leave it blank or they put like a low ball number that's nowhere near my day rate, I'm going to ask them on the call, hey, I need to know what your all in budget is. And that's where sometimes we actually are able to do multiple shoots instead of just one based on the deliverables. And that's kind of where I bring in like the retainer conversation. Mm-hmm. But I think those are like the three core for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll let them just another question that I'll ask is just like, tell me more about your brand and also what the goal is in the content. Mm-hmm. Because ultimately, us creatives need to shut up sometimes on the phone <laughs> and just listen yeah, and learn as much as we can. And that's kind of where I'm able to be like, hey, tell me as much as you can about your brand and your product because you know about it more than I do. Mm. And people love talking about their, their products and oh, services. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They do, yeah. I think another huge question to ask when you're on these discovery calls is, I always love to ask, can you name me like three competing brands that you look up to right now? Because then if they share with you like, who their competing brands are you can see what their content is like and you're like okay cool i could either a do better than this or b you're gonna need more budget if you want to pull this off so it's like a really good gauge i have a fairly specific question about pricing when it comes to licensing i've never really known about this and like what to charge for that so let's say i remember in your workshop you were giving like okay you have a mom and pop like hair salon Mm -hmm. versus working with like Ulta Beauty Mm -hmm. and you're going to charge more for like the licensing and like where this is living. Can you talk about like, like what do you charge? Yeah. Yeah. Corey Jenkins is a good buddy of mine. He's based out of Miami. Shout out Corey. Yeah. He shoots for like Pat Mahomes and stuff. Great, great, great dude. I asked him that question um, recently and he goes, if your parents and your like friends and family have never heard about the brand, you better not mention usage and licensing. Like, they're going to be like, wait, what's usage and licensing, Mm -hmm. right? But if it's a bigger brand, then I think it's okay to start talking about what that looks like. My ballpark is between 15 and 25% of the all-in budget. So again, with those bigger brands, it depends on the relationship. If I get brought on through an agency and the agency is like, yo, here's our all-in budget. Do you want to do photos? That's different. Then if the brand comes to me directly and Mm -hmm. says, Paul, we want to hire you to shoot a campaign for us Mm -hmm. and we're hiring you. That's when I'm going to say, all right, well, what's the usage and licensing budget? And also like, where are you looking to use the content? Um, How long is it going to live for? And all that. So 25% is probably the most common when I get brought on to these big budget shoots from companies that we've heard of. And I'll just set a reminder in my calendar and make sure that I track it and click up or notion to make sure to check in with them after the year or the two year term. So you guys, do you use ClickUp as well? That's for those listening that don't know what ClickUp is, it's a CRM. So do you do you both use ClickUp? I'm like a big Notion guy. Big Notion guy. My whole life is in Notion. You strike me as a Notion guy. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys look at SC, you'll I've, see Notion. I'm, I'm, like, I'm like, I'm all, I, Notion is freaking the best tool ever. Dude. That's so like, funny. I need to get on it. I'm not really sure how to use I, it. I try. It's kind of do, you, do you have like templates that you've yeah, posted? Yeah, will so, give you the template. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's got the fire yeah. templates. We don't have to talk about it, but basically like, <laughs> I love Notion. <laughs> sponsor me, please. <laughs> Notion, if you're listening, please sponsor me. I'm desperate. Oh my gosh. That's so funny. Oh my God. So do, you, do you like ClickUp? How I use that? ClickUp because I've actually become more of a producer. Mm. I brought Ned on it. Like we've done a yeah. lot of projects together and um, it's, I love the producer side of like big budget projects. Yeah, Paul's, mm. Paul's a great producer. So ClickUp is great for organizing it. Mm. Love it. Organizing yeah. tasks and assigning them to people that are involved. I love that. What percentage of clients that you're working with are coming to you guys versus you guys doing outreach? That's good. So funny because we were just joking last night before we ripped on our episode as well. He was saying that like my website's been down for like six months and like it has been like I haven't had a personal website because I was transitioning on like I want to get more work on it. So I took it down. It's like locked with a password, but it's been like that for probably like six months to eight months now. But to be honest, like nothing has changed in my business, which I find very fascinating because I I put a lot of weight on my website before. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a website. I think you should have a website and I need to get mine back up. But I think it's important to note that sometimes creators will put way too much weight Mm 
mm. on portfolio and their website they'll literally burn the midnight oil for like two weeks trying to get their website all dialed when in reality i feel like there's uh, so many other things that can also impact how, like the leading like inquiries that come in mm. um another thing i look at is when creators reach out to me or other people um are looking to like provide their services oftentimes especially in the creative industry i don't really care about your website necessarily but like send me some like work that speaks to what you're trying to apply for right now or work that is applicable to what we're talking about and then your instagram link i honestly think in this day and age like your social media is your resume like because with a website, you see the client work you've done, but with social media, you see the personality. Mm -hmm. You see like they're behind the scenes. You get to see like what camera they're mm -hmm. using. You get to see what they're like on set. You get to see how they talk. If there's some of them talking in a reel, I personally find that way more valuable than just being like, these are all my fire Vimeo selects. I also just feel like that just depends on what industry. Mm. I think they're buying yeah. from you though. You know, they want, yeah. they're like, I see this Paul guy. I, I'm looking at his stuff and like, oh, Paul seems like a really cool guy. I could hang out with yeah, Paul. Yeah. I want to, mm -hmm. I want to, I want to work with this yeah. guy. I have yeah. to spend eight hours with him. I don't Hell, let's get it tonight. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> After dinner, we're free. Hell yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. I know that you boys have to get out of here to go to another pod. I think I could go on for three yeah. more hours, um, but mm -hmm. I really loved this conversation. And my last question to both of you is what is some advice to your 18 year old self? You, you're talking to Paul, you're talking to Ed <sighs> at 18. So for right now on this creative journey before you embark on it, what's one piece of good advice? Mm. Come on, Eddie. You want me to go first? Yep. Take us home. Eddie. Let me, let me take a second thing about okay. this because there's so many things. Also, how old are you guys? I'm turning 30 this year, actually. Okay. I'm turning 27 this year. Okay, cool. Sweet. How about you guys? 25. I'm 27. Yeah. Dang, oh, nice. y'all are young. So, That's awesome. Some more yeah. age, yeah. I, I, hey, I got one. Yeah. I think advice I'd give to my 18 year old self is to say yes to as many opportunities as possible and to also look at others that are more expert, you know, better than you in the industry and do whatever you can to add value to them, not pick their brain for free, but to add value to them in a way that's going to make their life easier. Um, cause that's something that I wish I would have done. <laughs> Honestly, I was so stubborn growing up in Minneapolis. There is a lot of competition and kind of this like people aren't willing to share like what they're going through in their business. So I did the mar I definitely did the marathon, like instead of the shortcut. So if I could go back, I would tell my 18 year old self, shadow someone at an agency, do the internship, um, honestly absorb as much as possible. So then you can get to that point where you're actually making money and income that much faster. I agree. I, one regret I think I have is I wish I would have worked at an agency or found someone to shadow because Again, I feel like I'm I'm happy of like where I am. I feel like I could have gotten here a lot quicker had I like mm. shadowed someone for mm -hmm. sure. Mm. I yeah. agree. That's awesome. Working somewhere is so underrated. I feel like in freelance mm. talk already, a lot of people are like, oh, I got I want to freelance, I want to freelance. But there's so much value in working for a place that can you can learn all. I always joke with my wife. I'm like, if honestly, if like Nike offered me a job or something and it feels low paying, I would go. <laughs> So I just yeah, want to learn. I want to be yeah. around the or production. How are we going to do the podcast? Though? <laughs> you can do remote from. Bro, Portland. I would tell you to hire me though. Look, <laughs> like that's just that's just cool. You know, that's that's a hack though. Yeah. And, and gets a job at Nike yeah. and yeah. hires and us. Yeah, yeah, and the whole squad's working at Nike. Yeah, exactly. that. yeah, we'll have to work on a project. At some yeah, point. That'd be sick. I think the younger what I would tell my younger self though is I wish I would have documented my process a bit more. Mm. Um, I think early on I was very in my own head, and I think when you're first starting out. You're, you're always, you have, I think there's never a, sh a shortage of ideas. There's shortage of action that people take. Mm. Like everyone has great ideas, but to be honest, ideas don't mean anything unless you actually do something about them. And I think I was very in my own head when I was younger. I was just like, I have this idea. I, I know I could do this. I know, I, could, I know my, everyone knows their potential, but it just lives in your head. And I wish when I was younger, I would have was been okay with documenting the process a bit more because when I look at my favorite creatives now that I watch, the reason why they're my favorite is because I've kind of grown with them. Like I've seen their whole process, like how they've evolved. It wasn't like they lived in their own head for five years to plan this move and then to like, boom, drop this most like fire piece mm -hmm. because then no one knows what you've worked up until that point. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say if you're in your early part of your journey or you're younger, whatever age you are, just document the process like even if no one sees it document it so that you could look at it later that's so valuable because that's something you can never redo or get back that time that you were going through that growth i also think that creators when they're first starting out they get caught up in like well i don't have a like 
sexy studio to shoot yeah, at. Yeah, or exactly, like, exactly. Like, what, mm-hmm. it, what's interesting about what I'm doing? Mm-hmm. Like, that's right. I agree. Like, you don't even have to use it for anything. Mm-hmm. Just like document it because you're going to want to have that later on in your journey. Yeah. I mean, the mid combo, for example, right? Like, I'm so glad I made, I made like a little short film on like, I just quit my job. I was like running high on that energy. And I was like, these are all my moves that I'm going to do. At the very end of that little short film I created, it was like, I have this idea. It's so great. It's going to be this thing called mid combo, guys. Middle of the conversation, like super epic. <laughs> no episode shot yet. No guess. No That's nothing. Crazy. Like, I was still trying to figure it out. But now I look back on, I'm like, that's money footage to have. Mm-hmm. Like before I met Paul, before I knew any of this, like I have a clip of me being like, I want to do podcasting and mid convo. Like it's just cool to have. I don't know what's going to turn into, but imagine that, but just like your whole life and yeah. you can look back on it. You have a huge, I mean, your YouTube is just a big scrapbook. Of your exactly. Life, which yeah, is awesome. exactly. It's amazing. Where can the people find you? So everyone go check out the mid convo. We'll link it below. Where can they find you on social? Yeah. Uh, uh, Paul Ethan. Okay. <laughs> we'll link it below as well. And Edward Lee Films, yeah, yeah, Edward right? Lee Films, on all yeah. channels. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of the 505 Podcast. Make sure to subscribe, hit the follow button. We'll see you guys all next week. Peace. Bye. Peace. Hey.